Five Nights at Freddy's, Fazbear Frights, Number Two, Story Three, Out of Stock. It was just like Oscar to be on the losing end of the deal. It had always been that way, from the time his dad went to the hospital for a tonsillectomy and contracted a fatal infection, to the time that they had to move to the cheaper end of town, to all the times Oscar had to help his mom at the Royal Oaks nursing home while the rest of his friends spent their allowances at the mall. So it was no surprise to Oscar when he learned that the plush trap chaser, a light activated chomping green rabbit, and by far Oscar's favorite character from the Freddy Fazbear world, would go on sale on the most ridiculous day, at the most ridiculous time imaginable. Friday morning. Friday morning! Oscar steamed. Man, you've got to get over it, said Raj kicking the same stone down the sidewalk he'd been torturing the entire way to school. But the injustice of it, Oscar said. It's a kid's toy. Why would it go on sale when every kid in the known universe is in school? Oscar swatted at a low-hanging tree branch like it wronged him. Did you hear Dwight already got one? Isaac asked, bringing up the rear. What? Raj stopped for a minute, now adequately outraged. He hadn't even heard of Freddy Fazbear before last year. Apparently his dad made a call. His dad's always making a call, pouted Isaac. Dwight's a jerk, said Raj, and on this, the boys all agreed. It was so much easier to hate Dwight than to admit that they weren't the types who had dads who could make calls to get ugly green rabbits that stood the height of a toddler and maintained the speed of an actual rabbit. We'll never get it, not if we have to wait until four o'clock, Isaac said. We could, Oscar started, but Raj cut him off. No, we can't, he said. How did you- We can't ditch. Maybe I- It's not possible. I have two strikes already. One more, and my mom's going to send me to boot camp. Come on, she wasn't serious about that, Oscar said. You don't know my mom, said Raj. One time, my sister talked back to her, and my mom wouldn't let her talk for a week. That didn't actually happen, Isaac chuckled. Oh no, ask Avni. She says by the sixth day, it's like she forgot how to talk at all. Raj looked in the distance, haunted by the specter of his mother, while Oscar turned to Isaac. Don't look at me. I have to walk Jordan home. Oscar knew he couldn't argue with that one. Even as little brothers go, Jordan was okay, and Oscar knew for a fact that Isaac's mom would go nuclear if he even thought about leaving Jordan alone until she got home from work at three o'clock. There was no getting around it. Despite all of Oscar's big ideas, he knew he was too afraid to actually go through with it. Ditching school was like a mortal sin to his mom, who'd fought hard for her own education while raising Oscar by herself. Oscar and his friends would have to wait until four o'clock. The day was agonizingly long. Mr. Tallis made the entire class recite the preamble of the Constitution over and over until they got it right. Mrs. Daphne popped a completely unfair quiz on isotopes. Coach Riggins made them run laps around the field, even though it was still muddy from the last rain. Oscar thought maybe he'd never faced a more miserable day. Then, at 2.33, it got worse. Two minutes before the final bell rang, Oscar was called to the front office. Now, his geometry teacher shrugged, helpless to bail Oscar out, despite his being Oscar's favorite teacher. Sorry, Mr. Avila, nobody ever said sophomore year was cruelty free. He turned to Raj and Isaac in the only class they'd ever shared since they met on the playground in the third grade. 
Mustering all his strength, he tried not to choke on his sacrificial offering. Wait for me until 3.30. If I'm not back by then, the whole class sat in witness. Then go without me. Raj and Isaac nodded solemnly, and Oscar scooped up his notebooks and bag and cast one glance at Mr. Enriquez. It's your mom, he murmured, patting Oscar family on the shoulder. Mr. Enriquez knew Oscar's mom sometimes needed Oscar's help at the Royal Oaks nursing home. He didn't know exactly what his mom's job was, but it had something to do with making sure the whole place didn't come undone. His mom was important. The secretary at the front desk was waiting impatiently for Oscar, the receiver already in hand. Thought he got lost, she said humorlessly. Does your mom know this is why most parents get their kids cell phones? Oscar bared his teeth into something simulating a smile. I think she just likes hearing your voice on the regular, he said, and the secretary matched his smile. Besides, phones aren't allowed at school. Not that we can afford one, he thought, not without a little venom toward the secretary. Oscar took the phone from her hand fast because she'd looked like she was about to smack him with it. LM, Mr. Devereaux isn't doing well today, Oscar's mom said. His mom only used his nickname, LM, code for little man, when her need was dire. Not this, not today. Mr. Devereaux was possibly the world's oldest man, and when he was out of sorts, there were only a few people who could reason with him enough to get him to take his meds or eat something. For some inexplicable reason, Oscar was one of those people. Where's Connie? Oscar whined, referencing the only orderly to whom Mr. Devereaux responded. Porta Velata, where I should be, his mom said. Besides, he's asking for you. Oscar handed the phone back to the secretary, who already had her purse in hand, as she tapped her white-tipped fingernail on the counter between them. I trust you've resolved your crisis. I have to get to the toy box before they sell out of plush traps. I have five nephews. It was almost too much for Oscar to bear. Five fewer plush traps after Mrs. Bestley, Mrs. Beastly in his head, snagged whatever might be left for her undeserving nephews. Oscar dragged his feet in misery all the way to the number 12 city bus, transferred to the 56 line, and walked the quarter mile from the bus stop to his mom's work, moping into the lobby of the Royal Oaks nursing home. Irvine, seated at the reception desk, nodded to him from under his headphones. Dude's in a bad way, big man, Irvine said loudly, his volume unchecked by the deep bass line emanating from his playlist. He says Marilyn wants to steal his soul. Oscar nodded. Irvine was well versed in the oddities of Royal Oaks, including Mr. Devereaux's chronic baseline paranoia. Hearing Irvine confirm what his mom had already told him on the phone did nothing to alter Oscar's position of unconditional surrender. He would be here all afternoon, likely into the evening, trying to calm Mr. Devereaux, the plush trap chaser, if he'd ever had a chance at getting it in the first place, would never be his now. The automatic doors whooshed open, revealing the back of his mama's tall figure. She handed a clipboard back to an orderly Oscar hadn't met before. This place went through orderlies like Oscar went through electric blue fruit punch. Make sure Miss Delia doesn't get any diary after 4 p.m., his mom said. She'll fart so much, we'll have to quarantine the room. And I promise you, I'll make sure you're the only one assigned to that wing for the entire night. The new orderly nodded earnestly, clearly shaken, and hurried away with the clipboard, just as Oscar's mom turned a smile at him, arms extended. That was a thing about his mom. She could always be counted on for a hug strong enough to crack ribs. Even the time she threatened 
to put a bounty on Oscar's head after he rescued a bat and set it free in the house. She still managed to hug him hard enough to make him sore the next day. Mr. Devereaux thinks Marilyn wants to steal his soul, I heard, Oscar said. After 18 years, you'd think Marilyn had earned the benefit of the doubt. No rest for the truly suspicious, Oscar said, and his mom smiled at him. Thank you, little man. You are my angel. Mom, he said, looking around to make sure no one heard, even though the only ones who would give him a hard time were miles away at the toy box, claiming the very last plush trap, no doubt. The thought of Raj and Isaac lining them up for epic, chomping battles in the yard was pure energy. Oscar began to think about compromises. Maybe if he gave Raj or Isaac half the amount, one of them could be persuaded to let him take partial plush trap custody. Oscar managed a weak smile at his mom and wondered if the fates might bestow upon him a plush trap. If they witnessed his angelic behavior, he knew better than to hope though. When he arrived in Mr. Devereaux's doorway, he found the old man staring into the corner of his room, his eyes trained like lasers ready to vaporize. It started, Mr. Devereaux said, his voice barely above a whisper. What started? Oscar asked, not so much curious as eager to begin this process. She's been plotting this whole time. I should have known. She waited until I let my guard down. Come on, Mr. D. You don't really believe that. I can feel my soul slipping away. It's oozing out of my pores, Oscar. Mr. Devereaux didn't sound afraid. Rather, he seemed resigned to his fate. And Oscar thought maybe they had something in common today. But why would she do that? Oscar asked. She loves you. She's shared your room every night for almost two decades. Don't you think if she wanted your soul, she would have taken it by now? Trust cannot be rushed, young man, Mr. Devereaux said. Good fortune cannot be predicted. It was these seeds of wisdom that kept Oscar interested in Royal Oak's longest term resident. No matter how many times Mr. Devereaux let some sage observation slip. Oscar was surprised every time, like Mr. Devereaux could sense what was occupying Oscar's mind. Even if Mr. Devereaux's own mind was like a sieve, his thoughts slipping through holes into some bottomless abyss. Maybe Marilyn isn't stealing your soul. Maybe she is guarding it, you know, like holding it for safekeeping. Oscar posited, Mr. Devereaux shook his head. I thought of that. It's a tempting theory, but she should have asked permission. These are the times when Oscar struggled, when logic had to win. I mean, it's not like she can actually ask you, he said. Of course she can, Mr. Devereaux raged, and Oscar put up his hands, trying to ease Mr. Devereaux before the new orderly came scurrying around the corner. Okay, but just stick with me for a minute, Mr. D, Oscar said, sneaking two steps into Mr. Devereaux's room. Maybe she thought, you know, since you were close enough, that she wouldn't mind if she, uh, borrowed your soul for a bit. Mr. Devereaux cut his eyes toward Oscar, suspicious. She didn't tell you to say that, did she? No, 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 of course not. No one could come close to the, uh, relationship you have. Mr. Devereaux looked into the corner of the room that had held his attention until that moment. Well, Marilyn, what do you have to say for yourself? Oscar followed Mr. Devereaux's stare, and now they were both staring at the same ancient calico cat who had slept on the pillow by the window of Mr. Devereaux's room for as long as Mr. Devereaux had slept in his own bed. She didn't come here with Mr. Devereaux, at least according to legend. She'd been a neighborhood stray. But one day, the star found her in the room, and without objection from the rotating cast of residents, Marilyn had remained. 
finding Mr. Devereaux's company the most pleasing, despite his periodic disdain, or downright hatred. No amount of scratching behind the ears, or catnip offerings by anyone else could entice her away from Mr. Devereaux. Maybe she really was after his soul. Marilyn blinked her slow cat blink at Mr. Devereaux. Well, I think we both know what that means. Oscar improvised, and for a second, Mr. Devereaux looked confused. But after another moment of contemplation over the loud purring of Marilyn, something inside him settled. All right, then. It seems Marilyn owes you yet another debt of gratitude, young man. Marilyn stretched languidly on her chair and yawned. But Oscar wasn't looking for gratitude from a cat. He was looking for a way out. Sit down, young man. Sit down, Mr. Devereaux said, and Oscar let the last of his hope slip away. This was to be his entire afternoon. Oscar slumped in the chair closest to the door. Mr. Devereaux stared at him with the watery eyes of an old man. My soul may be in trouble, he said, but your heart is stolen. Oscar tried to laugh. If he didn't, he might cry. It was just the latest in what he was panning out to be a lifetime of almost. He had almost made varsity baseball, but he dislocated his elbow. He had almost saved enough for a cell phone, but someone picked his pocket on the train. He had almost had a whole family, but then he lost his dad. If you could earn a trophy for almost, he'd probably fall shy just of the honor. Ah, yes, Miss Devereaux continued. Love is a many splendid thing, until it crushes you to pieces. It's not like that, Oscar said. It was ridiculous to set the record straight. Miss Devereaux might or might not even remember this conversation, but he needed someone to know needed someone to confide in, and truly, he had never known a better listener than this man whom he had never once seen standing, whose first name he didn't even know. It's just a stupid toy, Oscar said, but even as he tried to diminish the plush trap, he felt his heart squeeze. It broke, Mr. Devereaux said. It was never even mine, said Oscar. And Mr. Devereaux nodded slowly. Marilyn began the long practice of cleaning herself. And I take it the toy will never be yours, Mr. Devereaux said. Oscar felt ridiculous hearing it in those terms, hardly something that should be causing a twelve-year-old to despair. It's not even that special, Oscar lied. Ah, but the toy's only the stem that breaks ground. Miss Devereaux said, and Oscar looked up from his feet to stare into the old man's eyes. He might have been slipping into one of his lapses, but Oscar was surprised to see Mr. Devereaux looking right at him. The reason for the wanting is what lies underneath. It's the soil that feeds the want. Mr. Devereaux leaned a little closer to Oscar, pressing his veiny arm against the guardrail enough to make Oscar nervous. I think you have tilled quite a lot of soil in your handful of years on this earth, he said. So much wanting. But you've never been able to pluck the fruits of your labor from the ground, have you? Oscar was never any good at growing things. He killed every plant he tried to water, every fish he tried to nurture. I don't think you know, he started, but Mr. Devereaux didn't let him finish. The best cultivators are the ones who know when the time is right to pick the crop, he said. And Oscar was trying, he really was, but Mr. Devereaux was losing him fast. Mr. D, you're real nice to try. Ugh. Mr. Devereaux groaned like something hurt. He leaned away from his position against the rail and arched his back. Oscar could hear something pop deep inside the man's rickety bones. Marilyn passed her bath long enough 
to make sure Mr. Devereux was okay. A Garoa, maybe. But a thinker, you're not. Mr. Devereux said to Oscar, Sometimes you have to know when to go for it, even when it doesn't look possible. Oscar said to Mr. Devereux, Quit sitting here and go find your precious toy. Mr. Devereux yelled, his phlegmy throat catching on the words, and he began to hack. Marilyn wound herself into a tight ball on her chair. The new orderly appeared out of nowhere, standing in the doorway, but reluctant to walk any closer. Is everything all right in here, Mr. Dev? No, everything is not all right, you dash ferret! Go and get me a glass of water, for the love of... The orderly scurried away, but Oscar couldn't seem to get up from his chair. He was frozen in place, contemplating the prophecy he'd received in a haze of cat hair and disinfectant. What? You don't think she looks like a ferret? No one should have a face that small. Mr. Devereux said to Oscar. But what if it's sold out everywhere? Oscar said, his brain finally coming back online. Don't you young people have the internet? Or your computer phones? Or I what's it? Somebody has the stupid toy somewhere. Mr. Devereux said, coughing up a little more plugum. The point is, quite tilling, it's time to pick. The orderly returned with a small yellow cup, and Miss Devereux took it from her roughly, before turning on her side, his back to her and to Oscar. Marilyn poked an ear up to be sure all was well before resettling into her coil. In the space of five seconds, Miss Devereux was snoring loudly, his ribs rising and falling inside his threadbare pajamas. Looks like you took it him out. The orderly said to Oscar as they shuffled out the door, closing it behind them. You're my hero. Oscar felt dizzy by the time he made his way back to the front desk. His mom was hustling down the hall with three orderlies in tow, each following her like ducklings struggling to keep up. You're a good soul, his mom said to Oscar without looking up from her clipboard. Oscar knew she meant it though. She was just busy. He calls the new orderly a ferret, Oscar said. His mum shrugged and mumbled something about a small face. Anyway, I told Raj and Isaac I'd meet up with them, Oscar said, slinging his backpack over his shoulder. Oh, anything fun happening? she asked, still absorbed in her paperwork. One of the orderlies was trying to get her attention. Oscar stared at the top of his mom's head, the grey streak that ran from her colic to her crown, suddenly looking larger, like age had poured over her head while she slept one night. Nah, he said, nothing special. She cupped his chin gently in her palm, finally looking up, and Oscar smiled back because she was always trying her hardest. She always had. He turned on his heel toward the doors. Oh, Oscar, can you pick up some yoga? Sorry, Mom, gotta run, Oscar said as he fled the lobby and returned to the safety of the vestibule. He was almost out the door when Irvine, still bobbing his head to whatever played in his ears, yelled over the music. You got a message, he said. Huh? said Oscar. What? said Irvine then pulled his headphones around his neck. You got a message from the short one. What's his name? Isaac? He called here for me? Oscar said, utterly confused. He couldn't remember a single time his friends had ever tried reaching him in here, even though it seemed like he spent just as much time at Royal Oaks as he did in his own home. If anything, sometimes Raj or Isaac would wait for Oscar to finish helping his mom wasting time in the vestibule while Irvine ignored them. Said you got to meet them at the mall. Something about a trap? Irvine said. The mall? Not the toy box? Wait, when did they call? Oscar demanded, which got Irvine's attention. Well, let me just check the messaging service, he said, reaching for an imaginary memo pad. Sorry, it's just ten minutes, maybe, Irvine said, softening. Ten minutes. 
if it took him 20 on the bus, another 10 to walk from the bus stop to the mall, there might still be time to get there before they close. I gotta go! Have fun! Eh, whatever, Irvine said as he pulled his headphones back over his ears, the dolls already swishing close behind Oscar. Oscar danced around the bus stop like he had to pee, leaning off the sidewalk into the street to see if he could spot the marquee on every passing bus. Drivers honked him out of the way, but he barely noticed them. Finally, the number 56 bus arrived, slowing to an agonizingly long stop and sighing down to meet the curb. It was standing room only, and Oscar felt irrational fury toward anyone who dared to pull the stop cord. It seemed there wasn't a two-block stretch where they didn't stop to let someone on or off, and Oscar was about to burst with impatience. When the mall stop finally came, he was so eager to get off, he nearly forgot to pull the cord for himself. Whoa, whoa, here! He yelled up to the driver, who grumbled something about not being his personal chauffeur. Oscar hauled a quick apology over his shoulder as he booked it through the thick grove of eucalyptus trees that were definitely someone's private property to get to the mall's east entrance, the closest one to the Emporium. The Emporium had nearly closed three different times, always on the verge of bankruptcy, always rescued at the last minute by some mystery financer who, according to Chipper New Anchors on the evening broadcast, couldn't better see another independent business succumb to one of the big chain toy stores. It might have been an act of charity if the Emporium hadn't been so gross. Oscar was pretty sure the place had ever been mopped. Mystery splatters lined the baseboards all around the cavernous stall, not a single stain ever moving from where it had made its home. Oscar himself had made one of those stains when he was 11, puking up an entire radiation green big slurp right in front of the beach ball display. Though he tried not to look, every time he went into the Emporium, he saw the telltale green flecks that had never been thoroughly scrubbed from the back wall. The stores seemed to always be half lit, the fluorescent lights high above buzzing and flickering like they resented being on. But maybe the most depressing part of the Emporium was its perpetually unstocked shelves. They'd carry maybe a handful of the really good toys everyone was clamoring for that year, but the rest of the cavernous store was occupied by half-emptied displays of dusty generic dolls, action figures, and play sets that the parents, who were too late or too broke, had to resort to. Oscar knew, for a fact, his mom had stopped into the Emporium more than a few times, always at the end of a nightly shift, looking for the closest facsimile to a brand name toy her small paycheck could buy. Oscar never let her see his disappointment, but the Emporium was the only toy shop located in the mall. All the rest in town were the big standalone stores. If Isaac was telling him to meet them there, they must know something that everyone else in the entire town didn't. Only that didn't seem to be the case once Oscar opened the door to the east entrance. Even from far away, he could see a squirming line of people trying to squeeze into the Emporium. It was more foot traffic than the store probably saw in a year. Oscar slowed to a walk as he approached the crowd with caution, so unnerved by the sight of that many people pushing to get into the Emporium of all places. Sure enough, there at the register by the door, a single petrified teenager was failing spectacularly at urging people to be patient. Poor guy probably had zero idea of what he was walking into that day for his shift. Oscar! Oscar searched for Isaac in the crowd, but as Irvine had reminded him less than an hour before, Isaac was the short one. He was hard enough to find in a crowd half this size. Over here! That time, it was Raj, and finally, after sweeping the jostling crowd three times, 
Oscar spotted his friends jumping above the surrounding heads. He wasn't all that far from the front of the line, which had to mean that he somehow got the inside track on the inventory. Oscar squeezed his way past a gaggle of angry customers. Hey, there's a system here, kid. One guy growled, and Oscar had to hide his laugh because, really, this was a system? Oscar ducked a couple more grumbles before finally reaching Raj and Isaac, the latter on tiptoe, trying to see how far they were to the front. Dude, we tried the toy box, marbles, and that place on 23rd and San Juan, said Raj, skipping right to the point. We even went to that weird organic place on 5th Street that only sells wooden toys, said Isaac. If they ever had it at all, they sold out in like five minutes, said Raj. But the Emporium has them, Oscar asked, still in disbelief. He hadn't actually seen anyone leave with one, and seeing was believing. Not on the shelves, Raj said, getting to the good part. We saw Thad outside of Rockets, and he was holding this big Emporium bag, so we knew something had to be up. He didn't want to, but he showed us. Well, he showed us the top of the box, and he definitely had one. He was all smug about it, said Isaac. I guess his sister's dating the assistant manager here, and he said they got a small stock of them, but the manager wasn't putting them on the shelf. Probably wanted to sell them himself online, Raj said. Jack, guess word got out, Oscar said, watching the crowd watch everyone else. No one wanted to be the first in line to hear, we just saw the last one. The crowd surged suddenly, knocking the entire quasi-line forward, and a general rumble of protest burbled from the customers. Isaac fell against Oscar, who fell against the lady in front of him, who complained louder than the rest. Excuse me, she said, only half turning to shoot Oscar a dirty look. The secretary, Miss Beastly, the one with five nephews. Oh no, Oscar whispered. She's gonna clean them out. He hissed to Raj and Isaac. She can't. Limits one per customer, said Raj. Don't worry, I've got a good feeling. Oh well, if you have a feeling. Oscar rolled his eyes, but secretly, he was grateful for Raj's optimism. It's not like Oscar had any of his own to offer. Mr. Devereaux's pep talk about harvesting was a distant memory. After an entire eon had passed, the line crawled forward, and the secretary from the boys' school was next. Do you mean limit one per person? Sorry, ma'am, that's the rule, said the clerk, looking like he was maybe seconds from a meltdown. Whose rule? My managers, ma'am, he said, and the line behind them sighed loudly. Haven't you been listening, lady? He said it a hundred times already, groaned one guy, unlucky enough to still be squeezed against the shelf closest to the door. Well, what am I supposed to tell my nephews? Miss Beasley asked, matching the guy's grumpiness. How about you tell them? Oh, I don't know. That the limit was one per person, the guy said, and Oscar had to admire his spunk. No one at school dared to talk to the secretary that way. Ma'am, the clerk interrupted, I can sell you one, but you'll have to move along. The secretary gave him a look that Oscar was pretty sure could melt human brains. I mean, uh, if it's okay, he said, but it was too late. He was already liquefying. Miss Beasley slammed her giant purse on the counter and tapped her way through counting out her cash, then exchanged it for one glorious plus trap chaser. It was the first time Oscar had actually seen one in the flesh, or stuffing, or whatever. Even from behind the cellophane window of the box, the thing looked perfectly terrifying. Its plastic eyes bulged from even wider eye sockets, making the face look skeletal. The mouth hung open to reveal lines 
of unsettlingly pointed, canine-looking teeth. With the toy standing almost three feet tall, the clerk had to stand on tiptoe to get the box over the counter and into the secretary's grasping hands. And she shooed away the plastic bag he offered, decidedly done with this entire transaction. She walked away in a huff, dozens of eyes following her petters out the door before returning their attention to the keeper of the treasure. The crowd surged forward, but it wasn't necessary. Oscar, Raj, and Isaac were practically crawling over the counter. One plus trap chaser, please, Oscar said breathlessly. If there's only one left, we can split it. The boys shoved their hands into their pockets to pull their money, a compromise they hadn't even needed to discuss. If one plus trap was all they could get, then they'd just have to share it, all for one and all that. They understood how scarcity worked. Sorry, the guy behind the counter said, but he didn't look sorry so much as terrified. What do you mean, sorry? Oscar said, but on some level he already knew. No. No, 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 no. Isaac shook his head. Don't say it. The clerk swallowed, his Adam's apple traveling up and down his neck. We're sold out. The crowd erupted in protest, and whether it was conscious or not, the clerk gripped the counter like he expected the floor to fall out from under him. It can't be, Raj said, but Oscar could barely hear him over the roar of angry customers. He looked at Oscar like he was begging him to lie and tell him it was all just a joke. There was enough of them. They wouldn't walk away empty-handed. It couldn't possibly be that Oscar had come so far for another almost. But Oscar looked at the petrified face of the clerk. What reason would he have for lying now? More than that, what reason would he have for angering a crowd already on the brink of revolt? The seed of disappointment was sprouting its roots in Oscar's stomach as the scene before him played out in slow motion. He pictured himself walking away with Raj and Isaac, circling the mall and dragging their feet back to the bus stop, unable to find the words to express this particular brand of letdown. Unable to describe how it wasn't the plush trap chaser, not really. It was the confirmation that people like him weren't meant to hope for things. While the clerk stood with his hands up, like his trembling palms could somehow comfort the angry masses, Oscar drifted to the side of the counter and tried to process yet another disappointment. He felt cut off from the scene around him, until a few intriguing words lured his attention away from the crowd's raucous protests and the clerk's weak responses. Call police, a woman's voice said. Who processed? Return, a gruff's man voice demanded. Real, a squeaky teenager's voice said. Human, the woman asked. Oscar inched past the counter and peered around a few stacks of cardboard boxes. Just beyond the boxes, three employees clustered around something Oscar couldn't see. Though their backs were mostly to Oscar, he was far enough from the crowd now that he could hear the employees discussing whatever it was they were looking at. No doubt about it, they look real, said a teenage staffer as he hunched over the thing. They're sure not from the manufacturer, said a man gruffly, who Oscar guessed to be the greedy manager, judging by his authoritative tone. How do you know? asked a third employee, her low ponytail slung over her shoulder, as she knelt beside the teenagers. Did anyone look at this one before it was sold? Someone would have noticed, wouldn't they? The teenager asked. I still think we should call the police, the woman in the ponytail said, her voice lowering so that Oscar had to strain to hear her. And say what? said the teenager. Hey, we think you've got a situation here. See, someone returned a toy, and, funny story, now the toy looks too lifelike. 
Help, officer, help! Keep your voice down, scolded the maybe manager. I mean, they can't actually be real, can they? The woman asked. The other two said nothing, and as though on cue, all three stepped away from the thing they were crowding around, and Oscar could finally see what they were examining. There, on top of a small work table, sat a mangled box that looked like it had been rescued from a trash compactor. Its cellophane window was dingy, with white crease marks spread like veins across the front. The corners of the box were soft and worn, and the top flap was held together by a fuzzy strip of packing tape. But even through all this damage, Oscar could see a green head and bulging eyes. A plush trap chaser! Beyond Oscar, the crowd's unhappiness crescendoed into a roar, and the clerk suddenly appeared behind the boxes. He didn't notice Oscar. He was too panicked. Help! The clerk shouted at the other employees. They're about to revolt! Before they turned, Oscar slipped back around the boxes. No longer eavesdropping on the employees, he ran to his friends, who were still pressed against the counter. The woman appeared beside the register and the panicked clerk. Her name tag said she was Tonya, assistant manager. I'm very sorry, Tonya called out, but the plush trap toy is now out of stock. No, it isn't, Oscar said, too quietly at first, and it was impossible to hear over the tumultuous crowd. When Tonya didn't respond, he shouted, Hey! She turned to him, her dark eyes intense. What? She snapped. You have one back there, Oscar said. Maybe he accused. He pointed to where he knew the plush trap chaser was behind the stacks of boxes. Tonya shot another look at the crowd, then glanced in the direction Oscar was pointing. She stared that way a little too long, then looked at Oscar like they were suddenly the only two people in the store. That one's damaged, she said. It looks fine to me, Oscar lied, pressing his luck. He wasn't sure what Tonya and the other employees had been talking about, but he was smart enough to know something weird happened to the returned plush trap chaser. He didn't care though. His need for the toy was all consuming. It's not fine, kid. It's, um, defective. Tonya crossed her arms. Trust me, you don't want that one. But it's not for sale, Tonya said through gritted teeth before yelling into the crowd. Folks, I'm sorry, okay? I'm sure we'll get some more at some point. Then she grumbled to herself. We'd better. When will that be? Demanded a woman in a shirt that said, keep calm and dance on. I don't... What am I supposed to tell my daughter? A guy in a suit and tie asked. Sir, you must... Your clerk said you had plush traps for everyone. Hollered a lady so close to Oscar, his ear rang with her shrill echo. I doubt she... The crowd was on the verge of mutiny, but Oscar barely registered them. Dude, we better get out of here, Isaac said. No joke, said Raj. My mom dragged me to some sale on bedsheets once. When they ran out, I actually saw this one lady bite someone. They were out for blood. Isaac looked at Raj in horror. I don't want to get bit. But Oscar was still only half listening. I don't care if it's damaged. I'll buy it anyway. He said to Tonya, but the crowd was too loud for her to hear him. She was unwinding the cord on the intercom. People, please calm down. She yelled into the microphone as feedback pierced the air, making everyone pause for a moment to cover their ears. But that only seemed to rile them up more, and soon customers were shoving and flooding the store, tearing toys off the shelves, as they looked for hidden plush trap chases, like they were on some sort of demented easter egg hunt. That's it! I'm calling security! Tonya yelled, then traded the microphone for the tan receiver under the cash register. I don't get paid enough for this. Come on, let us just buy the one you have back there. Oscar persisted. It was too much. 
The thought of leaving after coming this close. He couldn't bear it. Get lost, kid! Tanya yelled over her shoulder before pressing the receiver to her ear. Where's Mr. Stanley? Tell him I need some help over here, she said into the phone. Then Tanya turned her back on the counter. Oscar didn't think. If he'd been thinking, he never would have run around the counter and behind the stacks of boxes. He never would have shoved aside the teenage employee and the maybe manager who stood gaping at the crumpled three-foot box standing between them. He wouldn't have hoisted it up, accidentally clipping the teenage staffer in the chin while the clerk and Tanya yelled for Oscar to stop, to wait, to put it down. If he'd been thinking, Oscar would have answered Raj and Isaac when they suddenly appeared beside him, asking him what the heck he was doing. In that moment, the only thing bouncing around Oscar's head were Mr. Devereaux's words. The point is, quit tilling, it's time to pick. Oscar slammed that pile of pooled cash on top of the work table. He clutched the long, narrow box to his chest, turned, and ran around the counter. Then he dropped his shoulder to plow through the crowd that barely took notice of him. So invested, they were in their own mayhem. Stop! Stop! yelled the employees. But Oscar was already to the front door of the Emporium, which was certainly clear now that the crowd had moved inside. Dude, what are you doing? called Raj. But he was nearly beside Oscar, so it was clear that whatever he was doing, he wasn't doing it alone. Oscar could hear Isaac's short legs working double time to keep up behind them. That way! The clerk yelled, still too close to Oscar to be comfortably far away. They took it! They stole it! Stop! Yelled another voice, and this one somehow sounded more authoritative. Oh man, it's security! Isaac wheezed, and suddenly he was faster than Oscar and Raj, sprinting ahead of them and leading the way out of the mall, the east entrance now in sight. We're dead, Raj said, but he was keeping pace with Oscar. We're so incredibly dead! Oscar couldn't say anything. He could hardly process what his body was doing. His mind had completely left the building. Suddenly, Isaac swerved, and it only took Oscar a second to see why. Emerging from a restroom doorway to the right was a confused mall security guard hiking up his pants, watching the scene in front of him unfold with slow recognition of the problem. Oscar and Raj sped past him just as the guard behind them yelled, STOP THEM! The east entrance glowed ahead like a beacon of safety, and Isaac bashed through the door first, holding it while swinging his arm to Oscar and Raj. Hurry up! Hurry up! Hurry up! Oscar and Raj raced through, and the boys ran like a speeding arrow, Isaac at the head, while they made a hard right toward the private eucalyptus grove. But the parking lot was a wide expanse of obstacles before the trees. Isaac hesitated, and Oscar took the lead, weaving past minivans and SUVs like they were playing a human arcade game. The obstacles in security uniforms likely to come out of every corner. Except, it was still only the two voices Oscar could hear behind them. And when he ventured a brief look over his shoulder, it was indeed still just the two. And at least the one from the restroom doorway looked like he was starting to run out of steam. Get! He huffed between strides. Back! Here! We're losing them! Come on! Oscar finally said, his voice sounding like someone else's. It was like he'd left his body entirely, and this thieving, criminal escape artist had taken him over. He wasn't Oscar. In this moment, he wasn't anyone he recognized. We're almost there! Raj gasped, and they all knew he meant the eucalyptus grove. The menthol air was upon them and the strong smell 
coated the inside of Oscar's burning lungs. That's private property! Oscar could hear the other security guard yell, but he sounded farther away now. It was almost like he was telling himself that, not Oscar, so he wouldn't have to chase the boys once they'd crossed the tree line. Oscar threw the box over the fence and followed it, tumbling to the ground and rolling through the leaves that had begun to shed now that follows here. Isaac tumbled over the fence next, followed by Raj, and they took one more collective look through the slats and the fencing to confirm what Oscar already knew. The security guards had abandoned their pursuit, with the larger one resting his hands on his knees while he bent, huffing and spitting. The boys weren't done running, though. It was private property. And they shouldn't be there either. But it was more than that. It was wrong. They knew everything about what they'd just done was wrong. Especially what Oscar had done. Instead of facing that, he tried to outrun it. He ran all the way to his street, even as Raj and Isaac pleaded with him to slow down, that the danger was over, that he was being crazy. They pleaded angrily, in fact, and Oscar knew that maybe it was because he'd gotten them into this mess. He'd been the one to grab the plush trap chaser. He'd been the one to run like a bear was chasing him. He'd been the one to make them decide to run with him or leave him to his own terrible decision and all of its consequences. When they finally arrived at Oscar's house, lungs burning and necks sweating, their legs shaking hard enough to be useless, they collapsed on the floor of Oscar's small living room, splayed in a circle around the three-foot-long box that was damp with perspiration and decorated with stuck-on dead leaves. Technically, it wasn't stealing, Oscar said, first to regain his breath and possibly his wits. You're an idiot, Isaac said, and he meant it. I left our money on the counter, Oscar said, but he knew it was laughable. And Raj punctuated that fact by laughing mathlessly. You're an idiot, Isaac said again, just to be sure it registered this time. And Oscar nodded. Yeah, I know. This time, they did all chuckle. Not quite a laugh, and none of them meant it. But it was enough for Oscar to know that even though they hated what he did, they didn't hate him. And besides, now they had a plus trap chaser regardless of how they got it. But now that he could catch his breath, Oscar had time to reflect on the hushed conversation he'd heard between the Emporium employees. What was it they'd said? Something about the parts looking too real? It was hard to see why that would be a problem. The more lifelike the better, right? Still, the way they'd all backed away from the toy, something definitely wasn't right about it. Raj and Isaac knelt next to him. They were staring at the illegally obtained plush trap chaser. Raj glanced up at Oscar. Are we going to open it? Were they? They'd come this far. Was Oscar really going to let some disgruntled employees at the saddest toy store on earth keep him from the plush trap chaser now, after he'd finally seized the day? after he'd finally plucked the fruits of all his labors. Dude, are we opening this thing or not? Asked Raj. Okay, Oscar said. Let's see what this beast can do. It took some doing to get the thing out of its box. The molded plastic case that should have formed a protective shell over the toy had been crushed along with the rest of the packaging and it was now almost one with the toy itself. The plastic wedged into every joint of the rabbit's arms and legs. The twist ties that secured it to the mold had bent to hard knots that needed to be carefully unwound. And between the smeared and tired marked lettering, the instructions were essentially eligible. Once the boys had finally freed it from its packaging, Oscar stood the plus trap chaser on its oversized feet and straightened the joints at the knees to stabilize it. The toy 
was relatively light, considering the machinery that had to be behind it. The heaviest parts of the rabbit were its weighed feet, presumably for ease of movement and balance, and head, presumably for ease of chomping. I don't know why, but it's not exactly how I imagined it, Raj said. Oscar and Isaac were quiet, which meant silent, if reluctant, agreement. They didn't mean it in a snobbish way, though. Oscar had received more than his share of lightly damaged or refurbished toys, the byproduct of having more wants than money. And though Raj and Isaac could afford more, they never held that over Oscar's head. It was more like nothing could possibly live up to the hype that had preceded the release of this toy that, let's face it, didn't do much of anything. It ran fast, and it chomped fast. The simplicity, the plainness of its functionality, had appealed to Oscar, but more than that, the plush trap was wanted. It was what only the unlucky, the consistently passed over, would have to go without. Oscar couldn't be that kid again. He just couldn't. Um, is it just me? Or do the teeth look wrong? Isaac pointed at the straight, slightly yellow, human-looking teeth that were visible through Plush Trap's partly open mouth. No doubt about it, they look... real. Oscar had to admit the teeth looked a little off. Definitely not like the ones he'd seen in the ads, or in the one he saw Miss Beastly buy. Yeah, they're not pointed, Raj said. Why aren't they pointed? Oscar didn't volunteer anything. They're not pointed, but they're creepy, Oscar said. They look, he swallowed, human. Yeah, Raj said. They do. Weird. And what's with the eyes? Isaac said. He reached out and poked one of the cloudy green eyes. Ew! He whipped his hand back and flicked his finger. It's squishy! There was no denying it. Whatever was wrong with this plush trap chase's teeth and eyes was definitely what the employees were discussing in the back of the store. Still, Oscar thought, there's no way the parts could be real. He'd seen the eyeball when Isaac touched it, though. There was the tiniest give, like if he'd pressed on a peeled grape. There was no tap from his fingernail like there should have been on hard plastic. And then there were the teeth. That's why they were so freaked out, Oscar mumbled, and he only realized he'd said that last bit aloud when Raj and Isaac turned to stare at him. This is my punishment, Oscar thought. This is what I get for being an idiot and stealing this stupid toy. Okay, so I've got to tell you something I overheard in the store. Oscar said at the end of a long, pained sigh. How did you overhear anything in there? Isaac said, focusing on the wrong question. Oscar shook his head. Near the back room, these employees, they were all standing around the box, talking about how it had been returned, and how they should call the cops because... Because the eyes and the teeth are human! Raj blurted, as though his wildest morbid imaginings had come true. Uh, yeah, said Oscar. I guess when you say it out loud, it sounds a little ridiculous. Yeah, completely ridiculous, Raj said, eyeing the plush trap chaser. Totally, Isaac said, scooting a couple inches from the toy. I mean, it's not like any of us got a really good look at one close up, reasoned Oscar. They're probably all nightmarish, guessed Isaac. Raj turned to Oscar. You managed to steal us the only plush trap chaser that looks like a half-human hybrid. I think its eyes are following me, said Isaac. Maybe if we can see it in action, we'll feel better, Oscar said, trying to reboot everyone's enthusiasm. Raj shrugged. Why not? Isaac shrugged too, but then he held up the mod instructions. I think we're on our own. Let's see what those human teeth can do, Raj said. Isaac shivered. Stop calling them that, 
Oscar tried pulling at the plush trap's chin, but the jaw wouldn't budge. The mouth was only open enough to glimpse the human-like teeth, but it wouldn't open any farther. Maybe if you push from his nose, Raj said, gripping the top half of the rabbit's face while Oscar continued to pull on the jaw. Here, you need more leverage, Isaac said, taking the rabbit's whiskers in his fists and yanking. Dude, you're going to rip its face off, Oscar said, and stopped pulling a little too fast, sending Raj and Isaac rocking back on my heels. We just need something to pry it open, he said, trotting to the kitchen to grab a butter knife from the drawer. When he returned, he jammed the flat end of the knife into the partially opened mouth. But when he pressed on the knife, the thin metal gave suddenly, and the tip of the knife broke off inside the rabbit's mouth. The pointed end seemed to be stuck in its weird teeth. Whoa, Raj said. Tell me it didn't take a bite out of a knife. It didn't bite the knife, Raj. I broke it. Maybe it just needs to be turned on before it'll open, Isaac said. And finally, one of them was thinking clearly. Oscar and the boys parted the fur on the back of the rabbit, searching for a switch to indicate it was off. All they found was a line of Velcro closed over a battery compartment, complete with a rectangular 9-volt battery tucked into its place. Below the battery compartment was a pattern of small holes. Is that a speaker? asked Isaac. Hang on, it talks? Nah, Raj dismissed. Not in any of the ads. His brow crinkled. What does a rabbit even sound like? Gentlemen, focus! We're looking for the power switch. Check its feet, Oscar said. And sure enough, when they turned it over, a little black switch pointed to the on position. Okay, Isaac said. And he reached for the switch, flicking it off, then on, then off again. Maybe it needs another battery, Raj said. And that sounded like as good a reason as any. Oscar returned to the kitchen and rummaged through the junk drawer, sifting past rubber bands and orange juice coupons, until he came upon an open package of 9 bolt batteries with one left in the box. Try this one, Oscar said, hustling back to the living room. The boys plucked the existing battery from its place, scraping away the little bit of white crust that had corroded the inside. They placed the new battery in the compartment and closed the cover. Raj slapped his hands together and rubbed. This is it! Oscar picked the rabbit up and flipped the switch on, but the plush trap remained dormant, its mouth locked in a mostly closed position. Oh, come on! Isaac complained, the stress of the day clearly beginning to have an effect. Hang on, hang on, Oscar said, doing his best to calm the room. He was turning the box over and over in his hands, and there, in bold letters, inside a comic book style power burst, was a critical detail. Walks in the dark, freezes in the light. Guys, it only works when the lights are off, Oscar said, and his heart filled the tiniest bit of hope that all wasn't lost. Oh, Raj and Isaac said in unison, as though it made perfect sense. Of course, somehow they don't manage to forget this one crucial detail. The boys got right to work, pulling drapes shut and flicking lights off, surrounding the bunny in as much darkness as possible. But enough daylight still leaked through the curtains to eliminate the disappointment on their faces. The plush trap chaser would chase nothing. It's just not dark enough yet, Isaac said. It probably has to charge or something, Raj offered. But when neither Isaac nor Raj lobbied to take the plush trap home for the night, the last of Oscar's hope evaporated, leaving his insides feeling dry and cracked. It was just like everything else. He'd had the nerve to think something good might come his way. He'd even done the one thing he swore to himself and to his mom and to anyone whose opinion ever mattered to him that he'd never do. He'd stolen. All for the tiny drop of what could have been a taste. Just a taste of good fortune. 
Now he was left without one third of 79.99, without one plus trap chaser, and maybe even on the verge of losing the two friends who'd stuck their necks out for him when his thirst had become too great. Oscar's mom called that night. Anything exciting happened today? She asked. The same question she always asked when she was at work and he was at home. Feeding himself dinner and putting himself to bed while she worked the night shift and took care of the old people. Nothing at all, he said, just like he always did. Only this time, it had so much more to say it because something exciting had happened. And then it hadn't. Oscar woke to the smell of coffee like he did most mornings. His mom practically lived on this stuff. How she got home at three in the morning and woke up at seven, Oscar had never been able to figure out. When he rolled out of bed, he was momentarily startled. When he rolled out of bed, he was momentarily startled by the gooey looking eyes swimming in the gaping hollows of a green furry face. They really did look human. Whoa, hey there, creeper, he said to the plush trap. The rabbit stood at attention by his bedside, right where he left it last night. The tiny shard of a butter knife tip still stuck between two of the visible incisors. But just like yesterday, it did absolutely nothing. Not that it should, given the daylight streaming in through the thin curtains behind Oscar's bed. It was possible he'd gone to bed with the hope that a knight in his dark room would charge whatever power source hadn't been triggered by the boys the day before. It was just another stupid hope, though. Oscar shuffled down the hall in his flannel pants and kissed his mom on the cheek like he always did. If Raj or Isaac ever saw him do that, they'd never let him forget it. But Oscar knew what it meant to his mom, and he didn't mind it so much. After his dad died, Oscar took up the habit without his mom ever asking. When he was too short to reach her head, he'd kissed her elbow, then her shoulder. It was just a peck, hardly even a kiss given that Oscar tucked his lips into his mouth. But disappointing his mom wasn't really an option. After Oscar poured himself a glass of juice and a bowl of sugar flakes, he munched away as usual until he finally looked up and noticed his mom hadn't said a word to him. She was looking down at the newspaper they still had delivered every morning because, as she put it, a subscription was cheaper than a smartphone plan. She hadn't looked up even for a second. His stomach instinctively dropped. What's up? He asked, his voice pitched a little higher than usual. His mom slapped her coffee slowly before pulling her mug away from her mouth, her head still down. Seems there was some sort of accident at the mall yesterday afternoon. Oscar didn't think it was possible for his stomach to sink any lower, but it found a new depth in a hurry. Oh yeah? He said, shoving a mound of sugar flakes into his mouth and doing his best not to throw it right back up. Mm-hmm, his mom said. Says here the Emporium had to call security and everything, she said, taking another sip of coffee. Oh wow, Oscar said, spooning more sugar flakes into his mouth, even though he wasn't finished chewing the fast spoonful. All over some stupid toy. Apparently, a couple of kids even made off with one during the commotion. Then Oscar's mom did look up, fixing her dark brown eyes on Oscar's. People were always telling him how much they looked alike, with their smooth features and eyes like coal. Can you believe that? She asked. And Oscar understood that she was asking exactly that, if he could believe it. Because if he knew anything about it, anything at all, it wouldn't be so hard to believe it was true. Irvine mentioned something about you boys heading to the mall yesterday, she said, giving Oscar so many chances not to lie. She'd opened every single door to the truth, inviting Oscar to walk through to be honest. She was begging him not to disappoint her. 
But it wasn't just Oscar's lie to protect anymore. Oscar had made sure of that when he dragged Raj and Isaac along with him. So, Oscar made a decision. He disappointed his mom to save his friends. Must have been after we got there, Oscar said. Then he shrugged. A period on the end of the lie. Oscar's mom stared at him for so long, he thought maybe he could apologize without saying a word. He hoped his mom could hear it. Instead, she finally released his gaze and drained the last drop of coffee from her mug, folded the paper over itself, and threw it into the recycling bin without another word. Oscar had never felt smaller. He spent the rest of the day at home, avoiding Raja's calls and pretending he didn't hear Isaac knocking at his door. He lay in bed instead, staring at the bulging eyes of the plus trap while it stared back at him. You're worse than useless, he said to it. Or maybe he said it to himself. The next few days passed by Oscar in a blur, and finally Isaac and Raj cornered him in the cafeteria. Look, if you're possessed, we'll understand, okay? Isaac said. Just blink twice if you need help. Come on, man. If you're trapped in there, let us help you, Raj said, nodding with Isaac. I'm not possessed, Oscar said, but he couldn't make himself smile. Dude, if this is still about the plus trap thing, Isaac said, and Oscar thought that was a funny way of referring to a misdemeanor. It's not just that, Oscar said, and Raj and Isaac got quiet. Oscar figured they probably understood. They'd been friends long enough for them to notice that Oscar's shoes never had the right logo. That his backpack had to last two school years instead of one. First generation technology is always bogus anyway, Raj said. We'll save up for Gen 2. I'll give them a chance to work out all the bugs. Isaac nodded, and Oscar actually did feel better. They didn't hate him. He was down a mom and a plus trap, but he was up two friends. Things were starting to even out. That's probably what made the thing he had to say next even harder. I've got to take it back. Isaac put his palm to his forehead, and Raj just closed his eyes. Clearly, they'd seen this coming. With those eyes and those teeth in it? Raj said. Come on, dude. Just let it go. I can't. My mom knows. They both looked up. How are you even alive? Asked Raj. I mean, she didn't say she knows, but she knows, said Oscar. What good will it even do? Asked Raj. It's busted. Our money's already gone. And do you really want to answer questions about those, um, upgrades? Raj and Isaac looked around to make sure no one had heard. Oscar understood. It was bad enough owning up to the theft. Raj was right. He absolutely did not want to answer any questions about the eerily human eyes and set of matching human teeth. Which is still impossible, Oscar told himself, even though he hadn't mustered the courage to touch the eyes for himself and swore that last night those same eyes had followed him across the room. He shook off the memory. That isn't the point, Oscar said, and Raj and Isaac couldn't say anything because they knew it was true. It wasn't about the money or the toy, it was about the taking, and Oscar wasn't a taker. None of them were. You guys don't have to come, he said. I was the one who did it. But Raj and Isaac just sighed and looked at their shoes, and Oscar knew he wouldn't be walking to the mall himself by that afternoon. His friends would be there with him. You're an idiot, said Isaac. I know. For some reason, the box felt heavier in Oscar's hands on the way back to the mall. Maybe it was because of all the money they'd sunk into it. What if we see those security guards again? Isaac asked, and they stopped just outside the doors to the east entrance. Raj shook his head. What are they gonna do? Arrest us for returning what we stole? Good point, Isaac said, and they began to slow walk to the Emporium. But when they arrived, the Emporium was gone. What? 
Oscar whispered, as he read and reread the big orange letters, lighting the place above the glass doors that used to be yellow. Now they spelled, How's Halloween Hallway? Did we come in the wrong entrance? Raj asked, but they all knew they hadn't. Any doubts that remained were laid to rest the minute they walked through the door. The same stained and grimy floor spread the length of the store, but now, instead of shelves lined with dusty toys and dark spaces, every sort of Halloween accoutrement spilled from the metal racks. There was an aisle for decorations and lights, another for party favors, two for candy, and what looked to be five or six aisles crammed with every sort of costume, from murderous slashes to sparkly princesses. Did we fall through a wormhole or something? Isaac asked, scratching the back of his neck. Hey guys, look! Rise chuckled, pulling a green plush trap chaser costume from the rack and holding it against him. Dude, seriously? Isaac said, yanking the costume from Raj's hands and replacing it. Oscar made his way to the cashier's counter at the front of the store, the scene of humanity's meltdown not even a week ago. Where's the Emporium? asked Oscar in a daze. The girl behind the counter wore a pair of yellow antenna on long springs that bounced when she looked down from her patch at Oscar. The what? The store that was here before, Oscar said. Oh yeah, she said without answering the question, nor apparently caring to. Where'd it go? Oscar asked. Not a clue, the girl said, returning to the screen on her phone. I just filled out an application and poof, she said, waving a hand lazily. Here I am. But I need to return this, said Oscar, suddenly feeling very young and small next to this older girl. The girl looked back down at him, and her eyes widened just enough to know he'd finally gotten her attention. It lasted only a second though. Is that what I think it is? She asked, looking at her screen again. Why would you want to return it? You could sell that thing for a fortune. It's... It's not mine, Oscar said, looking down. When he looked back up, the girl had lifted the eyebrow closest to him. It is now. Oscar looked back down at the box in his hands, the cardboard looking more crinkled than ever. When he rejoined Raj and Isaac, they were dacked out fully in hockey masks and pixie wings. I'm going for a kind of murderous fairy vibe said Raj. I can't return it, Oscar said, and Isaac and Raj lifted their masks. Well, no one can say we didn't try, right? Raj said. Maybe it's for the best, said Isaac, but he didn't follow it up with anything, so Oscar knew he couldn't think of a reason why. Ten minutes and three sets of pixie wings and husky masks later, the boys headed back to Oscar's house to devise a plan for trick-or-treating. Every year, they vowed to make it to the other side of the train tracks where the good candy was rumored to be. Every year, they ran out of time, distracted by the false promise of the good stuff closer by. We fall for it every time, Raj said. Not this year, this year. We start on the other side of the tracks and work our way back. Oscar and Isaac agreed. It was a good plan. The plan set, Raj and Isaac fell deep into a match to the death on Raj's newest console game, taking turns after wiping palm sweat from the controls before each turn. You're going down, Raj said, but his thumbs jammed furiously at the buttons while Isaac sat back smiling. Every time, Isaac said, you say it every time. One day. You're just going to have to admit you're not the champion, Raj said, beads of sweat forming on his brow. Oscar was barely paying attention though. He was trysling away the remaining battery leakage from the compartment on the back of the plush trap chaser. The wind was picking up outside, and it looked like the storm the news had been blathering on about for the last week was finally going to hit. The electricity kept flickering on and off, which was only contributing more 
to Raj's losing streak. Come on, it doesn't count if the power goes out, Raj complained. I don't make the rules, Isaac said, smug in his luck. It had to make Raj even angrier that the game was his. So was the console. He should be better at it, except that they mostly kept it plugged in at Oscars because he was the only one without siblings hanging around begging to play. Oscar wasn't interested in video games right then though. Oscar, help me out here. Power outages weren't a redo, don't they? Raj asked while they waited for the power to come back on. The light outside was fading fast. Hmm, Oscar asked. He tried scraping away the rest of the gunk, swapping out the battery for one in the little fan that sat on his mom's bedside table, even turning the battery around to face the opposite charge, hoping maybe it was a manufacturing defect. Nothing powered the plush trap chaser though. Why are you still messing with that? Isaac asked, clearly tired of the drama it had brought for the last several days. He's right. Raj said, in a rare moment of agreement. It's hopeless, Oscar. Just let it go. I think we should literally let it go, Isaac said, as in get rid of it. He twisted his mouth for a second. It's not just broken. It's, I don't know, just wrong. Oscar didn't agree, but he wasn't going to admit it. He ignored Isaac, and he ignored Raj too. But Oscar didn't feel like he was hopeless. They'd gotten away from more security. He'd kept the truth from his mom. They tried to do the right thing and return it. It was like there was some reason he had to keep this thing. He flipped it over and stared into the murky glistening green eyes of the ugly rabbit. If you're possessed, blink twice, he said to the bunny, chuckling quietly. Yet while the plush trap didn't blink, it emitted a sound, a sort of quiet chirp, so fast it might not have happened at all. Did you guys hear that? Hear what? asked Raj. The power flickered back on, and the video game resumed, along with Raj and Isaacs arguing as they continued the tournament to the death. Then, just as Oscar was getting ready to flip the rabbit over again, and take his thousandth look at the battery compartment. He spotted a tiny hole at the side of the rabbit's metal jaw. At first, it looked like nothing but a bolt holding together the hinge of the lower jaw. From this angle though, Oscar could see that it wasn't a bolt at all. It was a port. Oscar's house phone began to ring as the lights flickered again. With the plush trap still in his hands, Oscar ran to the kitchen to catch the call before the machine picked up. Even if they could afford two phone plans, Oscar's mom would have insisted on keeping a landline. She was big on backup systems. The line was crackly and it took Oscar asking three times who it was before he could clearly hear his mom's voice. Ugh, the storm, his mom said. How about now? Yeah. I can hear you, Oscar said, barely listening. He was trying to get a closer look at the pot on the plush trap, but it was hard when the light in the kitchen kept blinking out. LM, I need your help tomorrow, she said. Sure, Mom, he said, not listening. I'm sorry to ask. You know how much I hate asking. It's just that the storm tonight, we've had so many people calling sick. We're going to be completely backed up on laundry and charts tomorrow, and... Are you listening? Uh-huh. Oscar lied. But it suddenly dawned on him why she sounded so apologetic. Wait, no, Mom. No, not tomorrow. I knew you'd be upset, hon. But it's... Mom, tomorrow's Halloween! Oscar said, suddenly panicked at what he'd agreed to. Not that he'd have had much of a say in the matter either way. I realize that, but sweetie, aren't you and your friends a little old to be- No! Why do you always do that? Oscar said, taking it a little too far. But now it was too late. Do what? 
Oscar could barely hear his mom now. The storm was encroaching on the phone lines and rattling the house from the outside. Maybe it was the fact that she sounded so far away that it made Oscar feel like he could say what he said next. You act like I'm older, like I should be just like you, like I should be just like Dad. You never let me be a kid. Dad died, and you expected me to just grow up. Oscar, I, I stole it, okay? I stole the stupid plush trap toy. Your little man stole it, Oscar said. And he knew it was cruel, but he was just so angry because it was happening again. Once again, he was missing out on what everyone else got to enjoy. The lights blinked off and on in the kitchen, and suddenly his mom was gone. Mom? But all that greeted him was silence, then the echo of his own breath, and finally, the rapid tone of the circuit's busy signal. Oscar walked slowly back to his room, just in time to watch Isaac put the finishing moves on Roger's fighter. All Oscar could do, though, was stare at the tiny pot by the plus trap's jaw. The damage of what he might have just done to his mother was too much to contemplate all at once. Raj, I need your cell phone charger, Oscar said. What? Right now? I was just catching up, he said, pointing to the screen. No, you weren't, Oscar said. Listen to the man, Oscar said. He speaks the truth. Oscar flinched at the reference to him as a man, and followed Raj to the hallway, where he fished a knotted cord from a drawer and handed it to Oscar. Oscar knew it was a kindness of Raj not to ask what he'd need a phone charger for if he didn't have a phone, but Raj was still following Oscar's motions with interest. Back in Oscar's room, Isaac had Raj's fighter's HP down to 10%. Oscar took a small breath and held it, then brought the charger's A connector to the hole in Plus Trap's head. When the plug fit snugly in place, Oscar exhaled. This is it, Raj. I'm putting you out of your misery in three. The sound of Isaac's fighter powering up for his death move pulsed in Oscar's ears as he marched the plush trap and charger to the outlet across the room. Two, said Isaac, as the lights began to flicker overhead. Just get over with it, Raj said miserably. And you're dead. Oscar didn't remember plugging the adapter into the wall. He didn't remember the lights going out, or Isaac's fighter winning the golden belt. If he was pressed, he might not be able to remember his own name. All he knew for the moment was that the room was dark, and he was on the other side of it. What the- He could hear Isaac say, Do you smell burning? He could hear Raj say, Oh, oh man, Oscar, Isaac said. Oscar? Oscar! said Raj. Oscar couldn't understand why they seemed so panicked. He could barely make out the outline of their heads in the moonlight that illuminated the room in flicks and whips while the tree branches outside waved under the storm. Oscar, how many fingers am I holding up? said Raj. You're not holding up anything, Isaac said, and Raj shook his head. Right, sorry. I'm fine, Oscar said, not certain that was true, but he was getting weirded out with them acting so worried about him. What's wrong with you guys? Uh, do you not remember soaring across the room? Raj said, as they looked even more worried now. Knock it off, Oscar dismissed, using the wall for support as he struggled to get to his feet. His head felt like it was stuck in a fish tank. We're not messing with you, Isaac said, and a close look at their faces told Oscar it was true. One minute, you're plugging in the charger. The next minute, you're airborne. I think it was lightning. Outside, the moon fought for space in the sky against the invading clouds. Inside, Oscar's vision blurred for a moment longer until he finally felt things come into focus. Maybe we should call his mom, 
He heard Isaac say, No! No! Don't call her! Oscar said, and they both looked worried again. What if your brain shorted out or something? Raj said. I'd still be smarter than you, Oscar murmured. He's fine, said Isaac. Oscar tried the light switch by the door. Dead. Isaac tried the remote for the television, but the screen stayed dark. Nothing. Well, I guess that settles it, Raj said, heading for the living room where their sleeping bags were. We have no choice but to get sick on scorching hot cheese knobs and knock out tomorrow night's plan. Raj and Isaac headed for the living room, but Oscar lagged behind in his room. Halloween, for a precious minute, he'd forgotten that he wouldn't be able to go trick-or-treating. As the clouds swept away from the moon, Oscar looked across the room and saw the blackened scorch line beginning at the outlet and traveling up the wall. Great, Oscar muttered. Something else to apologize for. He was already formulating his explanation to his mom when he swore he saw a flicker of movement from the plash trap chaser, still miraculously plugged into the fried outlet. Was that you? he said. But the ugly green rabbit merely stared back at him, the glow of moonlight making its buggy eyes seem to shimmer. Oscar closed his bedroom door so he wouldn't have to look at his series of mistakes. Just as the door clicked shut, Oscar swore beyond all reason that he heard Raj's voice from the other side of the door. Lights out, it said, with the faintest trickle of giggle on the end of the sentence. Oscar flung the door open, his eyes moving straight to the plush trap. What did you say? Huh? asked Isaac, already down the hall on his way to the living room. You heard that, right? Heard what? Oscar turned back to his room. Come on, Raj. It's not funny. What's not funny? Raj asked, poking his head around the corner at the other end of the hall. Oscar shook his head. Nothing. Never mind. Are you sure you're okay? Said Isaac, and Oscar conjured another laugh. Stupid storms making me hear things. In the living room, Raj and Isaac had torn into two bags of chips and was slurping electric blue fruit punch at a record pace. Isaac belched. Okay, so if we start here, just over the train tracks, we can work our way south, he said. They were studying Raj's glowing phone, opened to a map of the town that centered on the split by the rail line between the east and west side. It wasn't lost on Oscar that they lived on the wrong side of the tracks, a joke that was a little too on the nose to make even with his friends. No, we need to start south and work our way north, said Raj. But we'll waste all our time in transit, argued Isaac, punctuating his point with another loud burp. Dude, I could smell that one, said Raj, scooting away. And we'll move faster between houses if we're not already weighted down by candy. It's all about aerodynamics, he said. Oscar had been watching the plan hatch from the kitchen while he quietly crumbled. The boys finally noticed him standing there. Fine, Oscar can break the tie, Raj said. Where do we start, Oscar? North or south end of the tracks? I can't go. Raj let his phone dropped to the floor. He and Isaac exchanged a look, and Oscar tried hard not to believe they hadn't seen this coming. But Oscar was forever having to skip out on plans when his mom called on him. Her little man. It's my mom, he said unnecessarily. She needs... He couldn't even bring himself to finish. Eh, Isaac said, putting on his best act. It'll be lame anyway. Raj played along as usual. I bet the full-size candy bars are just a myth. Isaac nodded. And we'll split the stash three ways. Oscar knew they were lying about it being epic. He knew they'd divvy their hole with him. He knew they were disappointed. But he'd never felt more grateful for his friends. Whoa, is that a white streak in your hair? Isaac said 
pointing at Oscar's head, pivoting the conversation. Oscar reached for his head. Seriously? Isaac chuckled. No, but I'm sure you fried a few brain cells back there. Raj cackled. Not that you could afford to lose any. For the first time that night, Oscar felt settled. Maybe everything would be okay. He didn't have a plush trap chaser or a cell phone or Halloween. He didn't have his dad, but he had a mom who needed him, and he had friends who had his back. Oscar had just taken his place beside Raj and Isaac on the living room floor when a spear of lightning tore through the sky. The light was so bright at first Oscar thought his vision had blinked out. But when the light didn't return, and only the shadows and shapes of his living room surrounded him, he realized the rest of the house's power must have gone out. Uh, I think maybe you did a little more damage than just shorting out the socket. Raj said through the dark. Oscar stood and felt his way to the window, which was harder to see than before because whatever moonlight that had made it through the storm earlier was gone now, covered by a thick layer of thunderheads. Nah, he said pressing his cheek to the glass. The power's out everywhere. Lightning must have hit the grid. Isaac snorted. Bet it's not out on the east side. Ever wonder how theirs never seems to get hit? Hang on, I'll get some flashlights, Oscar said. Mom but a second one, after the last time the power went out. That one lasted almost two days, Raj remembered. We had to throw away half the food in our fridge. Two days, with no TV, no games, Isaac said, shivering. My phone lost charge by the middle of the first day, said Raj. The boys stared into their memories of the great power outage of May before shaking off the horror. Oscar handed Isaac the cheap, lightweight flashlight and kept the heavier one for himself. Gonna have to use your phone flashlight, Oscar said to Raj. We only have two. Sure, go ahead. Run my battery down, Raj pouted. Suddenly, the boys heard a thump coming from the other side of the house. Oscar might have been able to dismiss it as his imagination if Isaac and Raj hadn't reacted too. Did you get a cat or something? asked Isaac. Oscar shook his head, then remembered they couldn't see him. He flicked on his flashlight and Isaac followed suit. Another thump echoed from the same place, and Oscar swallowed audibly. Maybe a tree branch against the window? Raj offered, but he didn't sound convinced. Isaac shook his head and charged forward. This is stupid. Hang on, Oscar said, but Isaac was already halfway down the hall. When they rounded the corner, another thump, this one decidedly louder greeted them from behind Oscar's closed bedroom door. The house was too dark to detect any sort of shadow from the crack under the door, but the source of the sound was unmistakable. Something was banging slowly against the door in Oscar's room. So it was a no on the cat then? whispered Isaac, his voice shaking. It's not a cat! Oscar hissed, and Raj shushed them. As though in response to their voices, the banging stopped, and the boys held one collective breath. Then, all at once, the banging started again, this time twice as fast, and with so much force, it shook the door. The boys slowly backed away, but didn't dare take their eyes off the door. Still think of the tree branch? Isaac trotted Raj. Not unless the tree climbed into my room, said Oscar. You guys, shut up, said Raj, holding up his hand. Do you hear that? What is that? Oscar whispered. It sounds like scraping, said Isaac. They didn't have to wait long to find out. There, underneath the doorknob, a jagged hole in the plywood began to emerge, dug by a row of persistent human-looking teeth, strong enough to bite through a butter knife. As they dug, the teeth seemed to change shape, sharpening as they worked. No way, 
Oscar breathed. I thought it was broken, yells Raj, almost accusingly. It was, said Oscar. Can we please argue about this somewhere else, said Isaac, watching the quick progress the soul-like teeth were making on the area around the doorknob. Dude, it's a toy, said Raj. What do you think it's gonna... Then, with two more powerful bangs against the door, the bronze knob fell from Oscar's bedroom door, and it swung open to reveal a three-foot shadow with long, crooked ears. And while the plush trap was a mere shadow, its gleaming jagged teeth shone even in the dark. And was that blood around the edges of the front teeth? How was that possible? Unless the teeth were human, and the gums were human too. But then, would they still bleed? It was all impossible. So impossible. He couldn't bring himself to say any of it out loud. Then, all at once, the plush trap chaser ran straight for Oscar, Raj, and Isaac. Go, go, go! Raj screamed, and they sprinted down the hallway. Oscar heard a small clunk and nearly tripped over whatever it was. In here! The boys darted to the next closest room, Oscar's mom's, and slammed the door behind them. Raj shoved the others aside to lock it. Really? You think it could turn knobs? Said Isaac, trying to catch his breath. I don't know what the heck it can do! Yelled Raj. Then, the banging began, this time on the door closest to them, and the boys stepped away in unison, watching the door bow under the force of a three-foot bunny. Oscar's eyes widened as he heard the telltale sounds of scraping. The plush trap was about to chew through this door too. How do we stop this thing? said Isaac. The switch is under its foot, right? They continued to back away as the scraping grew faster, the rabbit's skills appearing to improve with practice. Oscar looked around the room frantically. Well, we better think of something quick, or that thing is gonna eat through this door too, and I don't think we can all fit in the bathroom, said Raj. Uh, uh, and Isaac shined his flashlight at the hole beginning to form by the doorknob. Quick, climb up on something, the highest thing you can, said Oscar, and they each found a surface, Oscar on the vanity, Isaac on the dresser, and Raj perched precariously on top of the headboard. In no time, the rabbit had chewed through this door too, and with a loud thunk, the doorknob fell to the carpet. Slowly, the door creaked open to once again reveal the vacant stare and crooked ears of the green rabbit. The boys held their breath and waited to see what the plush trap would do. It took a very little time for the bunny to make up its mind. A machine bent on its one job. It headed straight for the object in front of it, the dresser, and began to drag its jagged teeth across the wood of the wardrobe's legs. Are you kidding me? screamed Isaac, watching in horror as the bunny made fast work of one of the dresser's ornate legs. In another minute, the leg would be reduced to the width of a toothpick, and Isaac would topple to the floor right in front of this ruthless rabbit. Think of something, pleaded Isaac. Somebody think of something fast. How else do we turn it off? How do we turn it off? Oscar asked no one in particular, but little piles of sawdust were forming at the base of the dresser, and Isaac was already starting to slide. The light! Rai yelled from the headboard, momentarily losing his grip on the ledge and catching himself. The box said it freezes under light. My flashlight's in the hallway! Screamed Isaac, sliding inches closer to the rabbit. It took Oscar far too long to remember he was holding the other flashlight. Oscar, now! Raj hollered, and Oscar regained his senses and flipped the beam on the plush trap chaser. But it didn't work. Get in front of it! Screamed Isaac. And Oscar scooted to the edge of the vanity and stretched his arms as far as he could 
so the beam of light shone directly into the bunny's eyes. Suddenly, the toy froze mid gnaw as it opened wide for the last chump on the dresser leg. The room grew quiet as the boys gasped for breath, the beam on the bunny shaking under Oscar's trembling grip. Keep it steady, Isaac whispered, as though afraid he could wake the beast by sound. I am trying, hissed Oscar. The dresser was swaying under Isaac, trying to figure out how to stand on three and a half legs, and it wasn't going to hold Isaac for much longer, with or without plus trap chewing away at it. I've got to get down, said Isaac, more to himself than to his friends, but they understood. He was trying to gather the carriage. It can't move as long as Oscar keeps the light on it, said Raj, sensing Isaac's distrust of the momentary armistice. Easy for you to say, said Isaac, never taking his eyes off the green thing at the base of the wardrobe. You're not inches from a freaking wood chipper, and what the heck is up with his teeth? They're not supposed to look like that. I think it's safe to say there's a whole lot about the situation that isn't supposed to be like that, said Raj. Now would you get off the stupid dresser? He's right, Oscar encouraged. As long as there's light, it's not supposed to be able to move. It wasn't supposed to be able to move anyway, remember? said Isaac. How did it suddenly come to life? Neither Raj nor Isaac had a good answer to offer, especially not in that moment. Maybe the lightning? Something about when it was plugged into that socket? I don't know. What I do know is that the dresser is about a second from collapsing, said Oscar. Isaac nodded, accepting his fate. He was going to have to venture down to the floor, sliding himself as far away as possible from the open mouth of the plush trap. Isaac draped one leg over the side of the dresser, then snatched it back, throwing his balance off. Man, come on, said Rash, the suspense killing him. Hey, you pick which limb you'd rather have torn off, growled Isaac. And Oscar tried a different approach. Quick and easy, just like a bandage, he suggested. And Isaac seemed to like that approach better. Quick and easy, Isaac repeated, just as Isaac prepared to slide down the dresser from the far corner of the room, a corner where no one stood, a voice called out, Guys! Over here! Not just any voice, though. Raj's voice. Oscar didn't mean to move the light to the corner. It was instinct. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Put it back! Put it back! Oscar juggled the flashlight in his hands and swept the beam back to the plush trap's gaze, just as its teeth prepared to close on Isaac's sliding leg. Cute trick, Raj. Think maybe you could practice your ventriloquist act some other time? Said Oscar, struggling to regain his breath. But Raj simply stared wide-eyed into the corner. It wasn't you, was it? Said Isaac, holding his nearly sacrificed leg. Oh, come on. Seriously? Said Oscar. It can mimic voices? Our voices, said Raj, gulping, to distract us. The damaged wood under Isaac groaned, and he slid to the ground and ran faster than Oscar had ever seen him move. Then he skittered across the floor and joined Oscar on the vanity. Now what? asked Raj, and Oscar was ready with an answer. We leave the flashlight right here, right on it, he said. We barricade the door and call for help. Isaac and Raj thought it over for a second then silently agreed. Raj moved first, inching his way off the headboard and backing toward the door, never taking his eyes from the demented bunny, which, under the glow of Oscar's flashlight, had taken on a sickly green hue amid the surrounding shadows of the room. Then, just as Oscar and Isaac began to lower themselves to the carpet too, the beam from the flashlight began to falter flickering on and off in split-second intervals. Panicked, Oscar slapped the side of the light and brought the beam back to life, but only for a second, when it once again failed and reappeared. Oscar, said Isaac in a low voice, 
Is there any chance at all that wasn't the battery on your flashlight dying? The beam blinked out and reappeared again, but it stayed extinguished long enough this time for them to hear the jaw of the plush trap shut. Um, Oscar started, but he didn't have time to finish. When the beam flickered out this time, it stayed out. RUN! screamed Oscar, and he and Isaac clamored for the door, so close to Raj that they scraped his heels with their toes. They ran across the hall to the bathroom, and Isaac kicked his dropped flashlight ahead of them. They slammed the door, throwing their backs against it just in time to feel the force of three feet of metal and plush hit the other side. The rabbit wasted no time in running its cracked teeth across the wood, again tackling the area right around the doorknob. Isaac dropped to the ground and groped for his lost flashlight, juggling it between his hands before finding the switch and casting the beam toward the door. But they all knew it would only work on the bunny once it had chewed through the door, once they were face to face with it. Raj, where's your phone? said Oscar. Raj held it up like a talisman, its green glowing blue in the dark bathroom. Save the light, said Oscar. Just call for help. Right, said Raj, catching on. He quickly dialed 911 and waited for the relief that would come in the form of the operator's voice. What's taking so long? said Isaac, eyeing the handle as it began to wiggle in its loosening support. Nothing's happening, said Raj, trying again. What do you mean? It's 911. Someone has to pick up, said Isaac. I mean, the call's not even going through. Like, there's no service or anything. I don't know, said Raj, growing desperate. Okay, okay, said Oscar, trying to think it through. But the plush trap's teeth were starting to show through the door again. It was leaving tiny green threads on the splinters around the doorknob. Here's what we're gonna do. I'm going to open the door. Bad idea, Raj said, panic lazing his voice. Horrible idea. Wait, said Oscar, trying to keep his cool. I'll open the door, and I'll hit it with a light to freeze it. You two get out while I'm shining the light on it, and go to the kitchen. You can call for help using the landline. So you're saying we should just leave you alone with this thing? said Isaac. Unless you want to stay here with me, said Oscar. No, 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 we'll go to the kitchen. Raj interjected quickly. On my mark, said Oscar, absolutely not ready to call the mark, but it was happening one way or the other. The knob was about to drop. Three, two, said Oscar, and he grabbed the doorknob before it lost its place in the door. Go! Oscar flung the door open. The plush trap chaser burst through and went stiff in the light. Its eyes were so muddy under the close beam of the flashlight that it was difficult to remember they used to be green. The featureless orbs were somehow more terrifying than normal live eyeballs. Its mouth hung open hungrily, the teeth even bloodier than they had been the last time Oscar had looked at them closely. Its jointed arms extended straight in front of it ready to push through the door. Shallow breaths filled the tiny bathroom as Isaac and Raj jockeyed for space as far away from the plush trap as possible, but it was standing in the doorway. They'd have to squeeze past. Isaac sucked his stomach in, but the wiry hair of the rabbit still grabbed at his shirt. Raj winced and did the same, the top of the rabbit's arm brushing his ear as he scooted past and stood on shaking legs in the hallway with Isaac. You're sure about this? Raj asked Oscar. Nope, Oscar said. Just hurry. The boys scampered down the hall and yanked the receiver off the phone's cradle in the kitchen. But as Oscar stood eye to bulging eye with the plush trap, he could tell by the way his friends were arguing that they weren't getting through to 911 by the landline either. When they reappeared in the doorway, Raj was the one to deliver the bad news. The phone lines must be down. As there was confirmation, wind whipped against the house, rattling the space behind the walls 
but pipes snaked through insulation. So to recap, said Asuka, his light carefully trained on the bunny. We're trapped in my house with a mindless eating machine with exactly one working flashlight. Two, if you count my phone, Raj interrupted. During a storm that's knocked out the power lines and the phone lines. And the water, said Isaac, and the two boys waited for explanation. I got thirsty. I tried the tap. It can chew through almost anything, so, said Raj. So what happens when our lights run out of batteries, said Oscar. The boys all stared at the purse trap, as though it might provide an answer. It merely stared into the light Oscar didn't dare take away from his face. Hey, Oscar, said Raj, and Oscar didn't like the tone of his voice. It was obvious some new horror had just occurred to him. What? How are you going to get out of there? What do you mean? Same way you guys did. Uh-huh, said Raj, shaking his head slowly. We got out because you were shining the light on its face. Yeah? We're not facing it anymore. We're behind it. Oscar finally understood the light didn't just need to be on the rabbit. It needs to see it, he said, shuddering the prospect of those horrible dead human eyes seeing anything. Hang on, said Isaac. We can use the mirror. The boys tried to angle the plush trap toward the counter while Oscar's hands made the beam tremble. Hold it steady, said Isaac. I'm trying. Do you know how hard it is to hold something level for this long? My arm is killing me. Would you two shut up, said Raj, leaning hard against the plush trap. Isaac, help me with this thing. Dude, it's not that heavy. Raj stood away from the rabbit. You try. But Isaac couldn't make it budge either. It's like its gears are locked in place or something. They were quiet for another minute. Okay, here's what we're going to do, said Oscar. One of you is going to hold the flashlight over its head between the ears. Not it, said Raj. I'll sneak past, and then we'll all make a run for it. Raj nodded. Yeah, that could work. As soon as it turns around, we just back away, keep the flashlight on it for as long as we can. Exactly. It'll buy us time to at least get down to the end of the hole. It was the best idea they could muster. And it might have worked if the smaller, cheaper flashlight hadn't begun to flick in that exact moment. The great power outage of May had drained the batteries prematurely. No! No, 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 said Oscar. Why do all your flashlights die? Accused Isaac. Shut up and hold it, said Oscar. And they were all beginning to panic. Isaac cringed as he held his arm between the scratchy fur of the rabbit's ears, angling to beam into its bulging eyes as Oscar flattened himself against the doorframe. Let me in. I'll use my phone light, Raj said breathlessly. Too late, said Isaac. No room to switch places. Then, just as Oscar was pinned beside the plush trap, they heard a voice from the front door. Little man, I need your help. Miss Avila, Isaac called over his shoulder. Stay there, don't move. But it was Isaac who moved, just a little as he turned, but enough to move the beam of his light. Isaac, the light, Oscar yelled. Sorry. Isaac refocused the light on the rabbit, but his arm shook, and the beam began to falter, creating a deeply unsettling strobe effect. Now, the rabbit's head slowly turned in increments during the dark intervals between the flashlight's beam. When Oscar was nose-to-nose -nose with the rabbit, the flashlight failed completely. RUN! screamed Oscar, and the others followed suit, shrieking in unison as the plush trap lived up to its name, chasing them in freakishly smooth mechanical strides down the narrow hallway of Oscar's house. Raj tried to aim his phone screen behind him, but the beam of light wasn't bright enough. The flashlight! yelled Isaac, and Raj tried, but in his panic, the thin phone slipped right through his sweating hands. If there was any hope that the phone had survived its fall, the immediate crunch that came afterward extinguished that hope. The rabbit had stomped it. The garage! 
Oscar managed to gasp as they fled the biggest regret of his life. Throwing the door closed against the lunging rabbit, the boys listened in horror as it once again began to attack its obstacle with ruthless efficiency. This is the world's worst toy! Raj gasped. How did it know your mom's voice? Isaac wheezed. Who knows? Oscar said, throwing his hands in the air. Maybe it overheard her on the phone. He laughed hysterically. The possibilities are endless. Isaac clapped a hand over Oscar's shoulder. Snap out of it, man! You're losing it! Unlike the other rooms of the house, that had at least the benefit of shadows to see the space around them, the garage was pitch black. And as the boys groped for something they could use against the intruder, they managed only to knock tools off of shelves and trip over stored Christmas decorations. I suppose it's too much to ask if you have another flashlight in here somewhere, Isaac asked, his voice raspy with fear. Even if there was, I wouldn't know where to find it, said Oscar. Raj slapped at the garage door button frantically, but with the power out, it was no use. Don't these things have an emergency release? He asked. Logic finally prevailing. Fur and teeth were beginning to emerge through the chewed hole in the door to the garage. There's a lever, said Oscar, groping toward where he thought the middle of the garage might be. It should be somewhere right. He began jumping, stretching his hands high overhead as he swiped at the air, searching for the knob tied to the rope that released the emergency lock on the garage. Raj joined him in the hunt, taking a different place in the garage. Guys, Isaac said, and his voice was unsettlingly calm. Hang on, I think my finger just hit it, said Oscar. Guys, said Isaac again. Where, said Raj. Over here. Where's here? Here! Guys, said Isaac, and this time, they both paused to listen. The sound of scraping began to grow louder as the plush trap made quick work of the thicker wood of the garage door. What? They answered in unison. Where are we going to go after this? Oscar understood at some primal level why Isaac sounded so defeated. With no light anywhere to be found, all they could do was run. So what? We just hang out and get ground up into a hamburger? Said Raj, resuming jumping. Oscar's terror reached a new level when Isaac didn't have an answer. And to think, less than an hour ago, their most vexing question had been about which end of the train tracks to start that trick-or-treating on. The train! yelled Oscar, and just as he did, he heard Raj's hand connect with the wooden knob and string attached to the garage's emergency release. The knob slapped the metal of the garage door. Raj jumped again, and again, he stared at the knob swinging. There it is! You guys! Isaac yelled, urgency finding him once more, and they watched wide-eyed as the doorknob and the door began to wobble. He's almost, said Isaac. I'm almost, said Raj. Isaac's voice laughed from the other side of the door. This is it. I'm putting you out of your misery in three, two, and you're dead. Raj's fingertips caught the wooden knob, and this time, he yanked hard on the string, releasing the automatic arm holding the garage door in place. Get on that side, said Oscar, and Isaac grabbed the ridge of the garage door on one end, while Raj took the middle, and Oscar took the left. They flung the garage door up with enough force to make it hit the top of its track and come crashing back down. Just as it did, the handle from the door leading to the garage dropped to the concrete floor, and the door swung wide to reveal the plush trap chaser, set on its mindless destruction. The boys threw the garage door open with the same amount of force, only this time, they ducked underneath before it came crashing down again, putting them on the driveway and the rabbit in the garage. It slammed into the door, dragging its teeth across the metal as they winced under the sound. This isn't going to hold it for long, said Raj. And while the Oscar from yesterday might have doubted that even a functioning plush trap could cut through metal, the Oscar of tonight had every reason to believe it. It wouldn't stop 
until it had a reason to. The train, he said again, then took off running, taking it on faith that the other two would follow him. They barely reached the end of Oscar's block before they heard the squeal of twisted metal and knew their borrowed time had expired. They huddled over bikes left abandoned in people's yards and electrical transformer boxes, swatting away dead leaves and trash that swelled in the air and assaulted them, all to the soundtrack of a steadily moving mechanical rabbit, its jaw opening and slamming shut to the increasing speed of its chasing legs. Oscar dared to look behind him only once, finding the plush trap closer than he'd feared it might be, close enough to see the glowing whites of its vacant eyes. As the rabbit gained speed, Oscar and his friends lost theirs. The train tracks were still a quarter of a mile away. Do I even want to know how close it is? Raj asked, his breathing quickly transitioning to wheezing. Just keep going, said Oscar. Whatever you do, don't slow down. Oscar's legs burned as he pumped his arms, but even Oscar was starting to peter out. They just needed to make it a little farther. How? Isaac panted, swallowing before trying again. How do you even know there'll be a train? Isaac had guessed the plan Oscar didn't have time to explain. I don't, said Oscar, and Isaac didn't say a word after that. He understood. If there wasn't a train, then there wasn't any hope. Dipping into the clearest path they could find in the wooded land leading to the train tracks, Oscar, Isaac, and Raj raised their hands over their heads, shielding their faces from low-hanging branches as they listened to the plush trap crash a path through the trees, making quick work of any branches that dared to get in its way. When the path began to incline, Oscar knew they were getting close. His lungs were on fire, and Raj was beginning to cough and sputter in pain. When they crested the hill, Oscar saw the most glorious of all sights, light. I told you, Oscar panted, they never lose power. But as they tumbled down the slope, leading toward the tracks, they once again lost sight of the east side of town, and the dreadful realization struck Oscar that without a train to intervene, they'd never make it to the east side in all of its lighted glory. The sound was faint at first, nearly impossible to hear over the howl of the storm and the bus saw of the plush trap gaining on them. But when Raj and Isaac looked in the same direction, Oscar thought he heard it. He knew it wasn't just a phantom noise. The train horn! It's coming! It's coming! yelled Isaac, and they yelled a collective whoop, filled, filled with relief at hearing their savior approach. But they couldn't see it yet, and when they turned around, what they did see froze Oscar's blood in his veins. The shadow of a rabbit loomed tall across their feet before the bunny ascended to the top of the hill. It's not going to come in time, whispered Isaac. It'll come in time, said Oscar. The plush trap tipped forward at the hill's peak and launched, sprinting down the hill with expert, deadly precision. We're gonna die! This is it! We're gonna die! said Raj. It'll come in time, said Oscar, never taking his eyes off the rabbit. It was halfway down the hill before Oscar heard the beautiful sound of the train's horn cutting through the wear of the storm. The rabbit's eyes bulged, its ear stuck straight in the air at an unnatural angle, and as it pounded down the second half of the hill, Oscar could see shards of mangled metal from the garage door sticking out of its jagged teeth like chicken bones. Oscar dared to take his eyes from the plush trap just long enough to catch sight of a small circle of light at the visible end of the track. Go, Oscar said to them. No way, man, said Raj. All of us together. Just trust me, said Oscar. Are you nuts? said Isaac. Get across the tracks, Oscar said, a strange calm washing over his body as he measured the distance in his periphery of his vision. The oncoming plush trap and the oncoming train. His brain was doing calculus 
he didn't even know it was capable of. The horn blared through the air. The train was mere seconds away. So was the plush trap. Guys, it's going to work. This time, it's all going to work out. Just go! Raj and Isaac took one more look at the oncoming train before diving over the tracks and tumbling to the other side. Oscar could hear them screaming for him to cross too. He could hear them, but he wasn't listening. All he could focus on in that moment, in that split second between possible life and certain death, was the crackling but stubbornly alive voice of Mr. Devereaux. Sometimes you have to know when to go for it, even when it doesn't look possible. And in that impossibly small and infinitely huge space of time, Oscar finally understood what the old man meant. Sometimes luck isn't found. Sometimes luck is made. And when it is, you had to know when to grab hold of it. To the chorus of his friend's screams and the blaring of the train's horn and the grinding of the rabbit's teeth, he took three giant steps to the right toward the train, stepping onto the tracks and waited for just the right second when the plush trap chaser raced onto the tracks and turned to face Oscar and the bright beam of the train's light. Oscar had a split second to register the sinister eyes. From his ravenous, bloody mouth came the voice of Oscar's mom. Little man, I need you! Then Oscar jumped. The air surrounding him smelled of steel and fire, and at first, he didn't know what to make of the light. Was he in a hospital? Was he trapped under the train? Did I die? He had his voice in his ears, and it seemed detached from his body. Honestly, I don't know how, but no, said Raj, gulping at the air, gulping at the air, on the east side of the tracks, his body trembling hard enough for Oscar to feel the ground shaking under him. Or maybe that was the train. He could still hear the blare of the horn in the distance. Oscar looked to Isaac, whose hands were on his knees as he closed his eyes and shook his head slowly. You're an idiot, he said. I know, said Oscar. But once the ground stopped vibrating and their legs stopped wobbling, they crept over to the part of the track where Oscar had played his most dangerous game of chicken. There, twisted and flattened into the concrete ties and hardened soil underneath, lay the remains of one plush trap chaser, a light activated chomping green rabbit and no longer Oscar's favorite character from the Freddy Fazbear world. Dark green fur floated in clouds around the smashed rabbit, while other clumps stuck with grease to the rail ties. Tiny jagged pieces of teeth shone under the newly uncovered moon. The clouds finally parting after it was already too late to help. Bits of bloody human gum were attached to the teeth. Oscar swallowed down bile and shifted his gaze. Oscar stared down at the single grotesque eye that remained semi-intact, half buried but still bulging from the packed earth under the track. The other eye was smashed tissue, dead but looking more human than ever. He shivered and turned to walk away. He was unable to stand looking at such an unblinking killer. The next night, Oscar helped deliver candy to the residents at the Royal Oaks nursing home while his mom lit fires under the orderlies and rolled her eyes at the newest, dumbest ones. It was a sort of reverse trick-or-treating with the candy coming to the people since they couldn't come for the candy. When Oscar arrived at Mr. Devereaux's room, Marilyn was curled at the foot of his bed. Someone's feeling bold, Oscar said to her, but Mr. Devereaux was the one who answered. I've decided that if she's going to steal my soul, she's in the right, he said. And while it made zero sense to Oscar, it seemed to make enough sense to Mr. Devereaux that he no longer eyed the loyal cat with suspicion. So, how'd the harvest go? he asked, and again, Oscar found himself in the company of one of Mr. Devereaux's lucid moments. More than lucid, even. 
It's like he'd been standing right there on the train tracks with Oscar, one he needed it most. Bad crop this year, he said, and Mr. Devereaux nodded slowly, as though he'd been there before. Oscar tried and failed to imagine Mr. Devereaux with his own three-foot-tall chomping rabbit. But I'm glad I did the digging, said Oscar, and with that, Mr. Devereaux was satisfied enough to fall back asleep, Marilyn greedily kneading the space between his splayed feet. In the break room, Oscar found his mother, to whom he hadn't spoken since the morning, and only to explain that the toy had done just a little bit of damage to the doors, and he'd spend the next weekend patching them, and probably the rest of his natural life saving for a new garage door. His mom hardly seemed to notice, though. He supposed their fight over the phone earlier in the night had left more of a gaping hole in her than anything the plush trap could have done. Because he'd felt so awful about that, he did something that he knew wouldn't make up for it, but he knew he had to try. So he took what remained of his money and stopped into Howe's Halloween hallway and picked up a small and picked up a small plastic jack-o'-lantern and two bags of the chocolate-covered almonds she loved so much. He filled the pumpkin with the chocolates and stashed it in a cabinet in the break room until he knew she'd be taking her first coffee of the night. When he handed it to her, she smiled, but he thought she hadn't looked that sad since his dad died. Still, she pulled him in for the tightest rib-cracking hug in recent memory, and even though he could barely breathe under her fierce grip, he was so happy to know that he hadn't completely destroyed her. I never meant to depend on you so much, she whispered while she held him, and Oscar was surprised. He thought his dad was the reason for her sadness. He never considered she might be the reason. It's okay, and he surprised himself by meaning it. It really was okay. Not all the time, but he thought maybe that made the good times better. Like when his mom liked the present he made for her. Or when his friends put their active lives on the line, just so he wouldn't face a monster alone. It's okay, he said. And he let her hug him for a good long while. And that is the end of story three. Thank you for listening to this read-through of Five Nights at Freddy's. Fazbear Frights number two, story three, out of stock. I hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you did, please hit that like button. I really do appreciate it. And if you are new to this channel, subscribe for the next three stories in the next Fazbear Frights novel. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to my second channel where I do reaction videos. The link will be in the description. Also, make sure you click that bell so you'll be notified whenever I upload a new video. And I'll be back next time with the next novel read through. Alright, see ya.